Along a lonely stretch of blacktop in rural central Texas, my friend Larry Sanders takes me on a tour of a partially restored Atlas missile site. The height of the Cold War, Curtis LeMay and the Strategic Air Command built and deployed the first intercontinental ballistic missile system. We're standing atop an Atlas F ICBM launch facility. And, uh, this facility was built in 1961 at a cost of between 18 and 22 million dollars. There were two doors here that comprised what was referred to as the entrapment area. So when a crew reported here, they would pick up the telephone, uh, identify themselves, and then this door would be unlocked remotely. They'd step through this door, lock it behind them, and they'd be entrapped between two locked doors. They'd pick up another telephone, and the commander then would re-identify himself, and he would be given a number by the commander in control of the site underground. And he had to add to the number he was given another number to equal the number of the day that only the two commanders were aware of. And that's how they knew that it was a proper authorized visit by the, the new crew. Hang up the phone and the other door would be unlocked and that would give them admission into the launch control area. Then they would encounter two closed one-ton manganese blast doors. And these doors were designed in such a way that only one door could be opened at a time and that guaranteed that the crew would never be exposed to any explosion or threat externally. Manganese was used because it has a higher melting temperature than regular steel. But uh, for two ton doors, for two one ton doors rather, they still have total mobility and it's remarkable how smooth these doors operate even after all the years that have been exposed to uh, a rather high humidity environment. But, uh, that's, that's a one-ton door on swing there, and it's just remarkably well-balanced. This is the first level of a two-story structure referred to as the Launch Control Center. And this is where, level one is where the crew actually lived. Three sets of bunk beds, they had a full kitchen, bathrooms, showers, all the comforts of a missile silo. And uh, this is where they would uh, stay basically for the 24 hour shift. And it was uh, a toasty place to be. It's very comfortable, except there's a lot of complaints from the guys because this entire two story structure, and you notice the, uh, the chain link on the ceiling, this entire two story structure was suspended from the ceiling by four large air shocks that allowed the entire structure to bounce up and down in the case of a nuclear attack and the air shocks were coordinated by a central compression system. So as you walked around, as you left level one, went down to level two, or if anyone walked around, the entire two-story structure was being constantly leveled by that compressed air system. So if someone was up here trying to take a nap or something, they were constantly harassed by the tss, 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 the, the hissing of that compression system. The Atlas F is what they refer to as a balloon rocket. And that means that there's no internal structure of any type. It's inflated by its contents. So the lo lower third was RP-1 kerosene propellant. The upper two thirds was an envelope that contained liquid oxygen. And the entire missile had its shape as a result of internal pressure. If it ever lost pressurization, just like popping the top of a Coke can, it would deflate like a balloon. That's both a blessing and a curse because it's very difficult to maintain such a complex system. And because there's no internal structure, that's why you don't see any atlases on display at NASA or uh, any of the air parks around the nation. It has to be inflated or they have to create a fake atlas with a internal structure. The re-entry vehicle, which is their euphemistic way of describing the uh, nuclear weapon carried this uh, Avco Mark IV, approximately a uh, 30 megaton reentry vehicle, 30 megaton weapon, uh, approximately three to four times more destructive than the Hiroshima weapon. And the Atlas F, with its very accurate inertial navigation system, could 
deliver that reentry vehicle within a quarter mile over 8,500 miles away. So from any of the launch sites in continental United States, it could reach any strategic point in the, so in the Soviet Union, which made it a very, very frightening weapon for the early 60s. And that's why it's a totally successful weapon system, and it was never challenged by the Soviet Union, obviously. And though we say that, well, we never used it, we spent all that money, remember it's a deterrent weapon. So the ultimate failure of a deterrent weapon would be its utility. In the event of a nuclear attack, obviously the crew did not have a desire to be buried alive in this structure. So the Corps of Engineers, Black and Veatch Engineering Consulting Firm, etc., came up with an ingenious plan for escape, and that's the emergency escape system. Um, from this trap door to the surface, there was a tube, a concrete tube, filled with four tons of masonry sand that acted as a shock absorber and a heat absorber for nuclear attack. After the attack, the crew could then escape through the emergency escape hatch by coming over to this uh, pulling mechanism. They'd just pull down on that. It would release the lock on the uh, door. The door would swing open and the four tons of sand would fall onto the floor and spread out just like sands in an hourglass. And the, the crew had an extension ladder they'd attach to the ladder here and then just crawl out. So they were guaranteed a egress mode that as you enter the launch control center, you note that the no lone zone two-man concept was mandatory. And that meant you could never come into the presence of either the, the weapon system in the silo nor in this control area without being accompanied by an individual who was equally qualified to do whatever you were here to do. So it's the ultimate team concept in that regard. What makes this physical site significant historically is what you're seeing surrounding us in the level two of the launch control center. And, and that's the steel walls that you see around us. These steel walls comprise what is referred to as a Faraday box. Well, in this case, the Faraday box insulated the delicate instrumentation inside the control area from electromagnetic pulse. Now, the reason that's historically significant a number of historians have accused Curtis LeMay and the Strategic Air Command of creating a very accurate, devastating first strike weapon in the Atlas ICBM. And if that was the case, if the Atlas was designed by SAC and the Department of Defense as a first strike weapon, a Faraday box would have been totally irrelevant, unnecessary, because by the time the Soviet Union retaliated, this missile would have long gone. After this system was deactivated, the Atlas ICBMs were sent to Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino, California, and eventually refitted to be used as satellite deployment missiles. So all the Atlas E's and the F's were utilized for satellite deployment. So we got every penny out of those missiles, and of course, once again, uh, these sites serve their purpose very, very well. We're exactly 45 feet underground, and this was uh, the tunnel, the 40-foot tunnel that connected the launch control center to the Atlas launch silo. And again, we got two one-ton manganese blast doors, but in this case, these manganese doors were here to protect the crew from the exploding atlas. It's 52 feet across, and from the super hardened doors at the top to the bottom of the silo is 18 and a half stories, or 185 feet. The walls from level two to the surface are nine feet thick, and I used to describe those walls as reinforced concrete, and that's really a misnomer. The reality is this is a steel structure because it's comprised of nine feet of three inch rebar that's so close together there's just enough room for the concrete to flow around it and hold all that steel together. And that's what makes it all but impervious to a direct hit, except by a direct hit of a thermonuclear weapon. To think about this immense structure being 
created in a year is astounding. To create 72 of these simultaneously in a year is even further beyond imagination. But that's the wartime mentality that all these sites were created with.